This case will pave the way for new laws and interpretations of law. And Joshua Dreitel, Ross, Ross's um, attorney, said it's traditional for the government to use high-profile cases to make bad law. The government has already said in their papers, in reference to this case, that federal law is expansive and adaptable. And I don't have any reason to think that they're not going to try to expand law with this case. This case is the birth of law for a digital future. Watch it as a spectator at your peril. How will the result of the case affect everyone's future regarding the internet, liability, privacy, and Bitcoin? Precedent is going to be set with this case. It's going to be a historical case because these questions have not been addressed in the courts up until now. So laws will be made based on the Silk Road case. There are several different um, aspects of it. There's internet autonomy. How much will the government regulate and intrude into the internet with um, precedent set here? There is privacy. They have said in their um, papers that if you want privacy, say you use Tor because you want privacy, well that means you have criminal intent just by the fact that you use Tor. Another example is the money laundering statute. The thing is with the money laundering statute, it needs to deal with money. And they allege that Ross laundered Bitcoin. Now this is a big issue, you know, defining what Bitcoin is and the government's having a big fight with itself about what is Bitcoin. But the IRS has definitively and formally and publicly said that Bitcoin is property. And the Department of Treasury's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network agrees and says that virtual currency does not have legal tender status in any jurisdiction. But the prosecution argues that, well, let's just not have a definition in the money laundering statute and then everything can be funds, including gold, silver, barter, uh, barter Bitcoin, no restrictions on us so that everything can be subject to money laundering charges, which creates a much wider uh, umbrella of criminal liability and makes many more people criminals. There's a whole um, thing about the Communications Decency Act, Section 230, which Congress passed in the 80s to protect internet hosts from the activities of their users. It's, it only applies in civil cases. However, if convicted, God forbid, Ross will be the first alleged website host to be convicted for the, for the actions of users on a site. And our, our lawyer, his lawyer argues that this puts a crack in the door for website hosts in the future to be held criminal, criminally liable for actions on their site, even though right now they are protected in civil cases. They already said in their papers that they believe their laws are expansive and adaptable, especially when it comes to the internet. And he believes a precedent could be set that would later make website hosts criminally liable. How are they dismissing the Fifth Amendment and the Constitution in this case? Well, the Fifth Amendment with its due process clause and the Sixth Amendment and other um, legal um, precedents and doctrines all say that a, a statute must be satisfied with specific definitions and exactly match the allegations. But in all four counts against Ross, the statute does not match the allegation. For instance, the hacking charge is a good example. It, to satisfy that statute, you have to have hacked into a computer. They're not alleging that Ross did hack into a computer. They're alleging that he provided a platform where other people sold software that might be used to hack into a computer could be used for legitimate purposes, but it could be used for hacking, and so that means Ross is a hacker. And this is called transferred intent, and makes a one person responsible for the intentions and, and actions of another person. And this is what the Communications Decency Act, Section 230, why, why Congress passed it, to prevent transferred intent. So the, the spirit of that law is an exact opposition to what the prosecution is doing in this indictment of Ross.
Can you talk about the conduct and the manipulation you've experienced during this trial process? Yeah, um, you know, Ross's lawyer told me that the way the prosecution operates is by ambush. They wait till the last minute so that the defendant can't have time to rebut and then they drop something on you. They told Ross's lawyer about four new charges of murder for hire the night before the bail hearing. He didn't have time to talk to Ross about it. They accused Ross of six different charges of murder for hire and yet two and a half months later the same prosecutor at his indictment did not indict him in, in New York for one, not one. He, there were five in New York, the New York case, not one. So he was not indicted for murder for hire in New York. There is one indictment left in Maryland. It was, um, uh, it's been there since October. And I fully expect that to go the way of the others. Uh, but basically the charges of murder for hire that were used to deny Ross bail, he was never indicted for those charges. Um, also, and he, as far as I'm concerned, Ross is a nonviolent person with no priors, is, as his lawyer said, a poster boy for bail. So that was just a tactic for media extravagance and... Well, it certainly did the trick, him. didn't it? It smeared his reputation, it suppressed fundraising, and people were led to believe that Ross, who is the most peaceful, nonviolent, positive, compassionate person I've ever met, would, could be capable of murder and torture and talking like a character in a bad cop show, frankly, which Ross has never talked like that way in his life. And, um, you know, I don't know who that person was or if they even exist, but it wasn't Ross. And, but yet, this is the, this is what went blasted out on the media, with the media. And um, another example is that he, the judge ordered that Ross have access to discovery and evidence for the case so he could participate in his own defense. That was five months ago. He only, the other day, literally, I think it was two days ago, finally got access to it, that, that's five months, and um, now he's not sure he'll have enough time, they'll allow him enough time per day to really do what he needs to do. Meanwhile, his trial is November 3rd, and you know what? This isn't a basketball game where you run out the clock on your opponent so they can't score. This is a man's life and his liberty. And his due process rights, as far as I can see, are being violated. If Ross is convicted of one or more of the charges, how is that going to impact us? Well, if the, if the prosecution can misapply law, in Ross's case, it can do it to any of us. And what they're doing is taking laws that were designed for the physical world, do not match the allegations, even though the, the Constitution requires that they match the allegations, and trying to force them, strong arm them, onto allegations that simply do not match. This is unconstitutional, and I, I, for, as far as I'm concerned, um, if they're going to operate that way, that is a threat to us all. If we don't have rule of law and, and, and comply with the Constitution and, and prosecutors can just use the law as they wish without going to the legislature to make laws that fit, it's a threat to us all. You know, I, I can only observe what they're doing and it looks to me, and this is my personal opinion, that they will use this case to expand their power. It seems to me that's what they're doing and they've already said. Our laws are expansive. They use that kind of language. And, you know, uh, I'm just taking them at their word. This case is bigger than one man. This case is going to set law going into the 21st century. It's going to impact the internet, which impacts all of us. And um, laws will be made, precedent will be set. And as the quote that you said in the beginning, it's the law of our digital future. This is your future, and it's a matter of how do you want that to go? How, what kind of internet do you want? What kind of, how much freedom do you want? And this case will be a very crucial aspect of deciding those questions. And we need your help. And please go to our website, freeross.org, 
and, and help us in this fight, not just for Ross, but for all of us, because we need your help. We're up against a Goliath, and we need an army of Davids to come alongside us and help us. Please help us. The first thing they tell you when they arrest you is that what you say will be used against you, and they mean it. So I have to keep this brief. I'd just like to thank you for giving my mom, Lynn, the chance to tell you about the situation I'm in and why the outcome of this legal battle will have a lasting impact on you and the rules you live under in this country. One thing I've learned since beginning my tour of the federal criminal justice system is that these guys are not all powerful. Precedent can be set that will limit their ability to infringe on our rights. I urge you to stand by me and do what you can to turn this horrible situation into a win for us. I wish I could be there with you, but of course I can't. But with your help, though, I'll see you at Porkfest 2015.